Um, this next slide, I think every man in this room has had this look. Am I right? Does this tell you who really ran the White House? Am I right? Our family was just like yours. Okay, we just had better government housing. That's it. At 7:30 that night, we knew that the White House was going to call whoever they chose to be president, vice president. And then at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, they would announce it nationally. Well, we were home as a family, family dinner. And to put this story in perspective, how it started for us, we had two phone lines in our, in our home. One was a public line that had three or four extensions. The other was a private line that only had one extension in my parents' bedroom. Now, at 7.30 that night, we were at the dinner table, and the phone rang, and my sister Susan yelled downstairs, Dad, it's the White House. We all took a deep breath and walked upstairs. I went into my parents' bedroom. Dad went and picked up the, the, the private line. And on the other end of the line was General Alexander Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff at that time. And he said, Congressman Ford, he says, the President of the United States has something he thinks both you and your Betty, your wife Betty ought to hear at the same time. Can you put your wife Betty on? And before my dad could tell General Haig that there was only one extension on the phone, <laughs> the President of the United States got on the phone. And the next thing we heard my dad say was, Mr. President, if you could just call back on the other line, Betty could get on. <laughs> and, and he hung up. <laughs> now, personally, I gotta tell you, I didn't think that was a real career move. Uh, I, as an actor, could not make a movie happen unless I had it all written down for me, to know what that vision was. You couldn't just say, let's go make a movie without a script. You can't have a life without writing a script for your life or what you want. How many of us, and, and I, I'm to blame for this, years ago I used to do it. I'd get visions, never write them down, and I'd walk around. And How many of us in our lives today are just walking around, shuffling around without a vision for our own life? Have you written down a vision for your own life? I want, I want you to walk away today and take some of these skills and tools that I'm going to talk about, and I want you to be the director of your life. I don't want you to be the prop man. I want you to write a great script for your life, to be the hero in that script. The problem is most of us get a vision, but then we stop there. We get a vision with our family, our friends, our career, and then we just stop. We don't do anything with it. We never write it down. We never come up with actionable tasks to make it happen. I talked to you about having a vision, writing that vision down like a script. I talked to you about coming up with actionable tasks. Every time I get a vision for something, I, I, something I really want to happen, I write down five actionable things I can do to make that vision happen. But what, what I truly value my parents for today is their leadership of our family. And, and how they guided us, and how they, they, they had mercy on us, and how they, they just put things into us, like integrity and character. And that's what I want to thank them for today. This is one thing Dad never got credit for, though, when he was president. This slide that you're seeing right now, this is with Brezhnev. Dad got credit for the Helsinki Accord, and working with the Chinese, and things like that. But no one ever knew that he brought the high five to this country. He got this. He got this from Brezhnev. Motivate yourself for your career. Build a good professional life. God wants you to make money for your family. God wants you to provide security for your family. But I challenge you to, to approach your family life with as much zeal and vigor as you approach your professional life. And that's what I challenge us all today. What sort of examples, what sorts of character are we leaving for our children? What sort of stories are you leaving for your community, your family, so they know who you are? Character is something, when I think of character, I think of character is what you do when no one's looking. Are you closer with your father now than ever? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think for me, in the last two or three years, uh, I've gone to him and, and asked him to, to tell me some of the stories of, that I didn't hear before. About stories like when he oh, was a kid? Um, when he was a kid, uh, one of the great stories I heard two years ago when they retired his jersey at the University of Michigan, um, only the second football player to have a jersey retired. 
and we were on the field, and, and a story came out that in 19, uh, and Dad, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in 1934, Michigan had been national There's champions. There's a picture that day. Yeah, that's right. There, there it is. Uh, Michigan had been national champions in 1932 and 33, undefeated. In 34, hmm. Dad was captain of the team, and they were to play Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech said that they would not play Michigan because Michigan had one black, black player on that team. Number 61, Willis Ward. He was in that picture in the upper left-hand corner. Michigan was playing Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was an all-white school. Georgia Tech found out Michigan had one black player on the team, and they said they would not come to Michigan and play the game. Willis Ward, number 61, good friend of Dad's. Dad was so incensed that Willis Ward couldn't, couldn't suit up for the game. That, that that injustice, now again, this is 1934, not 1994. Dad was 20 years old, made a decision to quit the team, wrote his father a letter, explained it, said it was unjust, it shouldn't happen. Willis Ward came to Dad and a couple other members of the team who also quit. And he said, I, I want you guys to suit up for the game. I want you to go out there and beat Georgia Tech. Now, that year, 1934, Michigan only won one game. They came off two undefeated seasons, national champions. The only game they won in 1934 was against Georgia Tech. They beat them 9-2. to two. This is the thing of rat poison here. If we, if we push in, we'll see. You know what rat poison is made of? 99.995% of rat poison is basically peanut butter. It tastes good. It doesn't hurt you. It's like our current culture. It doesn't hurt you. You love it. It only takes 0.005% of rat poison to kill a rat. A little rat poison snuck into my life. Didn't take much. Very successful time in my career. Had a series on. I was working at a racetrack, making a lot of money. And the closet started being filled with skeletons and I let a little rat poison sneak into my life and I became an alcoholic and 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 thank God I had a mother and and God had mercy and grace on me and he provided me with a family and a mother that had showed me that it showed me how to get over adversity my dad gave me a book my two brothers and I and my sister he gave us a book about 10 years ago and he put in there some handwritings of his convictions about his own life. And every father should do this for their son. And he wrote down on a single sheet of yellow paper, this has been copied, handwritten, about several topics. And he gave them to each one of our, uh, us kids, my two older brothers, Mike and Jack, and my younger sister, Susan. And he felt that these were very important to a young man or a young woman growing up. And here are the topics that he wrote on personally, where he made himself accountable to us later on. What does religion mean to me? Definition of a successful marriage. Advice to a young man going off on his own. Learning how to lose, the art of compromise, learning how to make friends. And this book is like, this book is like a Bible to me. It's my second Bible, but it is a Bible because it's for my father. And I look at what he, the instructions he gives me on a successful marriage. Um, he talks about there must be a belief on the part of both people that there is nothing of higher priority than the sanctity and constitution of that relationship. A son needs to hear that. I challenge each of you to go home, take a yellow pad out, write these things to your own children, because we as children are proud to have them. We want to know where you stand. We want, you to, we want to see your integrity. We want to see your character. And that, Dad, is what I thank you for today. I thank this man. I, I thank this man for loving me, for taking care of me, and leading our family. Thank you very much. So go home. Tell your kids good stories. Have a vision for your life. Find out actionable things you can do, and please do it with integrity. Thank you very, very much. Steve is a very accomplished speaker. He, he knows how to present in a way that uh, really reaches the heart of people. It was funny. 
I, it was nothing that I expected and I really walked away with just feeling good and just, gosh, really reflecting on my life. Do I have a vision? What made me think? But Steve emphasized a refreshing viewpoint that it's actually our children and the character that we're building in them that is the most important and successful thing that we can do in our lives. Well, where can you hear those stories about life in the White House and with slides, too? It was pretty neat. Hey, thanks for your time. I look forward to working with you personally to customize a speech for your group. Hope to hear from you soon. We, we would love to have him back again. It was really a truly a memorable experience. Yes.